Welcome back to Challenges of Faith Radio Program. I'm Gary McCance, the producer and host. Thank you for joining. I'd like to acknowledge God and our listeners. My guest tonight is Dr. Michael A. Caparelli, the author of five books, with the latest being Monster Mirror, 100 Hours with David Berkowitz, once known as Son of Sam. Michael is a former pastor of 16 years and a Ph.D. in Advanced Studies in Human Behavior. His books, lectures, and resources help us navigate through mental health issues from a faith-based perspective. His nonprofit organization, Unmuted, which helps give victims of trauma their voices back. He travels the world speaking at churches, schools, prisons, and other venues. Michael's new book was ranked number one new release in true crime on Amazon for the first week of its launch and is endorsed by other brethren with a four words and reviews by former Colombo family mobster Michael Franzese, former New York police detective Philip Ferrer, the Daniel Amen of Amen Clinics and Reverend Dr. Wilkerson, co-founder of Teen Challenge, and Dr. Lee D'Alphonse, a psychoanalyst. Dr. Caparelli, welcome to Challenges of Faith radio program. I sure can. First and foremost, how are you, your wife, and loved ones? I'm doing well, thank you. We're out of uh, Rhode Island right now, which is about two hours from New York City, about an hour from Boston. Weather is uh, pretty beautiful here today. All right. Uh, Things are good. You're moving right along. Hey, it's an honor to have you on, Doctor. <clears throat> Thank what you. Were your aspir- what were your aspirations while growing up? Uh, aspirations while growing up, my grandfather, my mother's father, was an author, wrote books in our area, uh, books in particular about the, the mafia. Um, I come from an Italian-American family, and uh, he had a pretty popular book, a bestseller in this area called The Making of a Don. And I remember him sitting me on his lap as a kid and uh, typing away at the typewriter. I knew I wanted to be an author um, early on. I didn't know that I would pursue a, a doctorate degree in behavioral science and teach in colleges, uh, psychology, and even pastor for about 16 years. None of that was in the, the, the view, but um, <laughs> authoring books was from, a, from an early age. You know, I can imagine um, when you when you talk about um, watching um, uh, the lineage, uh, writing about from the um, I want to call it organized crime standpoint. And the reason why I said that, um, <clears throat> I usually try to um, say to different uh, listeners and audiences that. They can learn a lot from watching all three Godfather movies. And the reason why I say that, as I'm sure you would agree, that it's because it tells it tells a story about a hand, a puppet, and the strings. It kind of like lets you know who's really controlling things. And once you That's understand true. that, then you're able to look at the life a little bit different. Most definitely. The term in Italian is Petronavante, which means someone pulling the strings. That's right. <laughs> doctor, why did you pursue your doctorate in advanced studies in human behavior? I was pastoring the church for about 16 years. Uh, in my pastoring experience, I had lots of exposure to people with mental health problems. Uh, those that were released from prison had criminal backgrounds. And many times I reached an impasse, a point of not being able to go any further, and I, I knew I needed a better understanding of human nature. So probably somewhere around year 10 of pastoring, I had already completed my bachelor's and my master's. I decided to go for the Ph.D. in, in uh, advanced studies in human behavior because I wanted to help the people that I was shepherding. Uh, that degree took about seven years to complete. It was uh, close to five years full-time of uh, coursework, and then my my research, my dissertation took about two and a half years, 
And then when I completed the PhD, I actually resigned uh, from pastoring to, uh, to travel, speak in churches on mental health subjects. So for me, the degree gave me a better understanding of the human makeup. And it also, believe it or not, even though it was a secular degree, it helped confirm my faith in the Bible uh, because I, I, I saw many of the truths in the Bible and realized the Bible is the greatest psychology book ever written. I don't just mm-hmm. read it, but it, it reads me. Um, That's right. It's a mirror, as the, as the Apostle James calls it. He calls the Word of God a mirror. And it's a mirror that confronts the sinner in me and it un- unleashes the winner in me. So I, mm-hmm. I found myself um, not only learning about human nature, but paralleling it with my understanding of the Scriptures. And when the Scriptures and the science come together, it's very powerful. That's right. You know, and, and just think about what you're saying, because as you know, there's no disrespect to anybody intended. Um, and as you know, a lot of uh, individuals behind the pulpit may not have the totality of it all. They may have the scriptural knowledge, and just like you alluded to from the secular standpoint, what you, what you are looking at in reality is the saint and the ain't, meaning the individual before they came to know Christ and individual afterwards. And that's what that advanced studies has allowed you to do because, like you indicated, you're talking about human behavior. And as we delve into tonight's topic that I've already introduced, then the audiences hopefully get an opportunity to take a look at self. It kind of reminds me of that individual in the Word, as you know it to be, where he, he uh, paraphrased and beat his, you know, put his fist up to his chest and beat it and looked up he glad he was he's not like that person over there but in reality when you put the mirror to you and me we're just like that person over there the only difference is as the listeners will learn uh, continue to learn tonight is the redemption part through jesus christ i couldn't agree with you more <laughs> dr caparelli did you ever imagine that god would have you interviewing and writing a book about a serial killer you know, no, I didn't. However, there were many uh, foreshadows from early childhood on, as is the case with many people that have a calling on their life. You know, the calling is, in one sense, sudden and surprising, but then also you look back retrospectively, and you can see the grooming and the developing of God, even from a young age. Um, I grew up in a home where my dad was in prison. I visited him in prison. Um, I don't want to say more because the Italian families, you're kind of, you take what they call omerta, <laughs> which is the code of silence. Mm-hmm. But uh, I grew up uh, exposed to certain elements of the human population. Um, I had the police raid our house. I was about five or six years old in the bathtub playing with my, my G.I. Joe guys, and my mother was yelling, and the cops kicked in the door. They thought my father was hiding in the bathroom. So I've seen some things at a, at a young age, the darkest side of humanity. Good family, very loving, but uh, just involved in some uh, lifestyle stuff that was part of our culture. And um, so that early exposure, I think, uh, put in me a certain level of tolerance that I could handle um, hearing the story of a man like David Berkowitz, not shy away from it, uh, but try to understand it. And not condemn it. You know, Dr. Daniel Amen is a very famous uh, psychiatrist as well as a brain expert in America. Um, he, re- he read my book. He interviewed me on his show. Um, I mean, he's written five or six New York Times bestsellers, wrote the book called The Daniel Plan with Rick Warren. Very well-known doctor. He's a shrink to the celebrities. And when he was done reading my book, he gave me a blurb. I put it on the cover of the book. And I think it sums up well my, not only the book, but it sums up my call, one of my callings of life. He said it is easy to call people evil. It is very difficult to understand why. I highly recommend this book. And uh, that, that, I think, that, un, that willingness to understand a man like David Berkowitz, uh, to not condemn, I think that that began at an early age for me. Um, so retrospectively, looking back, I'm not surprised that God used me to uh, conduct a 100-hour case study on David Berkowitz. But certainly when it, the opportunity presented itself, it did, it did come suddenly. 
All right, so let's set the stage for those who may be unaware. Wikipedia, not the court system or the law enforcement system, says, David Berkowitz, born Richard David Falco, also known as Son of Sam. He grew up in New York City and served in the United States Army, pled guilty to eight shootings that began in New York in 1976, used a 44 special caliber bulldog revolver, killing six innocent people and wounding seven other innocent people, and by July 1977, terrorized New Yorkers and gained worldwide attention. Berkowitz eluded the biggest police manhunt in the city's history while leaving letters that mocked the police and promised further crimes, which were highly publicized by the press. Berkowitz was arrested a year and one month later on August the 10th, 1977, and indicted for eight shootings. He confessed to all of them and initially claimed to have been obeying the orders of a demon manifested in the form of a black dog belonging to his neighbor, Sam. After being found mentally competent to stand trial, he pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences in state prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. He subsequently admitted that the dog and devil story was a hoax. In police investigations, Berkowitz was also implicated in many unsolved arsons in the city. Intense media coverage of the case lent a kind of celebrity status to Berkowitz, which many observers noted that he seemed to enjoy. The New York State legislator enacted new statutes known popularly as the Son of Sam laws, designed to keep criminals from financially profiting from the publicity created by their crimes. The statutes have remained in New York despite various legal challenges and similar laws have been enacted in several other states. During the, the mid-1990s, Berkowitz by then, professing to be a converted evangelical Christian, amended his confession to claim that he had been a member of a violent satanic cult that orchestrated the incidents as ritual murder. A new investigation of the murders began in 1996 but was suspended indefinitely after inconclusive findings. Dr. Caparelli, apart from Wikipedia and any omissions, let's begin with why would you lead the interview and do a case study of the son, the son of Sam, a serial killer, during your 100 hours and 34 sessions? I saw David Berkowitz's interview on the 700 Club back in the 1990s, and I was most impressed with the idea. At that, to- at that t- time, it was only an idea. I hadn't seen the reality that a psychopath could be transformed. That, to me, was... Uh, mind-boggling because I know from a clinical perspective psychopaths make very little headway in therapy um, the data shows that they those that have this psychopathic personality what's no know, what's known as antisocial personality disorder that's the technical uh, label they don't show good progress statistically in therapy and uh, I mean it's pretty well known in cancel culture movies television that these types of people, they don't change. They are what they are, and that's it. So to see David Berkowitz uh, on the 700 Club transformed, to me it was this was something worth looking into because if God could transform a psychopath, he could change anybody. So I decided to write um, David Berkowitz a, a letter, sent him a letter in 2021 along with a copy of my book called Dr. Jesus, a book that I wrote in 2021 about mental health subjects from a biblical perspective. Well, he read the book, and within two weeks he wrote me back, and he said, would you visit me? And I said, I'd love to. When I visited him, uh, we decided that his story should be told. He was happy that I would tell the story because I was both a clergyman, somebody that would pay attention to the spiritual uh, factors behind his crimes but at the same time I had this higher education in psychology so he wanted someone that could also articulate on the psyche what was happening within his psyche to lead to this kind of breakdown so um, it was really that that set the stage uh, for my case study with David Berkowitz you know it's interesting and and I'm enjoying our uh, fellowship at the same time 
And the reason why I'm posing the questions in which I'm doing as we delve into it is because as a, as a former investigator of organized crime and having had the assignment of looking into cults and occults on top of my biblical background, um, you are sharing, especially I heard what you said that when he responded to you as relates to from the clergy standpoint, because as you know, there are a lot of individuals who um, may have that title, and that's no disrespect of what I'm going to say, but they may not have the knowledge, the, not only uh, the book knowledge, but the practical knowledge uh, as relates to cults and occults. Would you agree or not? Yes. I mean, we, we did explore in one chapter uh, with a, a social phenomenon is de-individuation. And de-individuation is something that happens uh, to, a, to an individual that's been immersed in a particular type of culture. And they begin to lose their identity, even their morality, their ethos, their value system as they're immersed in, or submerged in that particular culture. Uh, for instance, we see this in 1940s Germany. You know, the German people were not abnormal. They were pretty, uh, many, many Germans were devout family members. They were good people. But they were so immersed in Nazism that the majority of Germans went along uh, with Hitler's destructive plans. I mean, kindergarten teachers that were escorting little children out of the classroom, little Jewish children, telling them they were going on a field trip and chauffeuring them into a train that would lead to the gas chambers. So we see this social phenomenon known as de-individuation, and it also happens to people when they get involved in cults. Um, they get swept away by the social dynamics of that cult. Now, I say social. I believe behind this social dynamic is a spiritual reality, but, you know, supernatural phenomenon um, encapsulates itself in, you know, natural laws. And one of those mm -hmm. natural laws that I talk about in the book is the individuation. Proverbs 1 is a great example. Um, you know, the wicked man says, come, let us, key word us, go ambush the innocent. You know, there's this us factor. We see it with uh, Lot and his home being surrounded by a mob of sodomites. I mean, they're, this mob, this angry mob mentality, this group think, um, this de-individuation factor did play a role in David Berkowitz's killings. Now, I will say this to you. Um, I don't want to give up the ending of the book. He did make a very shocking confession that kind of flew in the face of some – uh, prior things that he had said, I'll let the reader uh, mm -hmm. learn that for themselves. But the reality of the cult still stands. He definitely mm -hmm. was involved in a group of people, with a group of people that met at a park, a few parks in New York City. And uh, they were certainly involved in some dark practices that played a role in the breakdown of David's psyche. Mm -hmm. As a child, why was he fascinated with the occultic things and darkness? I, you know, I think it had a lot to do with his shame. Um, David Berkowitz had lots of shame throughout his childhood. It's a, a, a theme that you'll see often. There are many examples of it, from an uncle who body shamed him. He was a very chubby kid. Uh, to being shamed in New York City for being Jewish in a predominantly Italian neighborhood. So some anti-Semitism, uh, shame of adoption. He had been adopted, the only kid adopted in the neighborhood. Now, why do I bring up shame? Because when we're shame, as we see with Adam and Eve, we hide. Um, darkness is something that we gravitate towards. I mean, if you can remember being a teenager and having a pimple on your face, mm -hmm. you didn't want to walk into that well-lit <laughs> room. You know, the exposure, mm -hmm. you know, makes you feel like a freak. So for David Berkowitz, mm -hmm. this attraction to darkness, I believe, in many cases, in many um, examples of it throughout his childhood, was rooted in shame. He would spend hours hiding in the closet when his mother thought he was outside playing stickball on a summer day with his friends. Sunny afternoon, and he's hiding in a dark closet. And uh, he just began to crave the darkness. And then, of course, that led to a, a, 
an appetite for dark films, a lot of horror movies, um, just really caught up in, in, in the realm of darkness to a point where he believes something possessed him at a young age. He would have fits where he would throw himself to the ground, punch himself in the head, try to throw himself in front of subway trains in New York City, have to be held against the wall of the subway station. Reminds me of Mark 9 when the evil spirit threw the little boy to the ground and threw him into the fire. He felt this this paranormal force. Um, he believes there was satanic involvement from a young age. But I personally believe that Satan preyed upon uh, David's shame, which Satan looks for some type of entry point, some kind of threshold. And I think in David's case, the shame was a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And just like uh, you know, uh, when one is little, they can be involved in the Ouija boards and all that, which lends a door opening for satanic forces at the same time. What type of fear of abandonment, abandonment did David experience? Well, David was adopted at a very young age, only four days old. Um, but, you know, it, and that may sound innocuous to a lot of people. You're adopted at four years old, four days old. You know, what's the big deal? You only had four days of bonding with your birth mom. Well, that's not entirely true. The bonding with your birth mom does not begin the day you're born. It begins the day you're conceived. Nine months in the womb. We've got a lot of medical studies that uh, corroborate a theory known as prenatal development or prenatal programming. That when babies are born, the day they're born, they can distinguish their mother's body odor and the, and the sound of her voice in a room full of strangers. So there's, there is a, a strong bond that takes place between a mom and a fetus. Now, we say fetus, but really it's life. I believe fetus is really just the euphemism the culture has come up with to mm-hmm. almost take away, take away the, 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 the reality that it's life in the womb. Um, that's a whole other subject. I could talk a lot about abortion and the evil of it, but um, my point is there's a bond between David and his mother. And that bond was severed at four days old. Now, if you talk to adoptees, most adoptees are not going to become serial killers. However, serial killers are 16 times more likely to have been adopted, even at a young age, than the, than the general population. Why is that? Someone's going to ask that question. And I, I really believe that when that bond is disrupted, even at four days old, and I'm a huge proponent of adoption. I, get, I write a missions check every month to an organization that helps link you know, foster kids with adopted mm-hmm. parents. So I believe in adoption. But I think at the same time, we've got to take note to the fact that there, something can happen where if you talk to a lot of adoptees, they'll tell you they struggle with bonding. It's very difficult for them to get close to someone because I believe instinctually um, it's what uh, one scholar calls a primal wound, a wound that is so deep, it's, it's, not, it's before any type of cognitive development takes place. Our minds are not even developed yet, but our central nervous system uh, remembers. It remembers that bond disruption. And David Berkowitz would tell you all through his childhood, he had a very difficult time bonding with his adopted parents, and they were wonderful people. He believes he pushed them away from a young age because he was afraid of being abandoned. And mm. I believe that fear of abandonment was very primitive. It went all the way back to four days old uh, when David was uh, uh, torn from his biological mother's arms. And uh, supposedly they drove him from Brooklyn Hospital to their apartment in the Bronx as a baby, and he was inconsolable. As much as they tried to coddle him, to comfort him, he kept crying. And all through his childhood, from young, you know, his infant years, all the way till adolescence, he was a very, very difficult child, uh, very hard to bond with, and uh, has struggled even with bonding, even to this day at 70 years old. So what led him to want to search for his biological family? Well, I mean, here he is at 20 years old, 21 
comes home from the Army, spent three years in the military. He was in North Korea. I'm sorry, South Korea. He's in South Korea in the, in the military, and he comes home. And uh, his friends from high school had all scattered in different directions. He's feeling very alone. Um, his father had remarried because his adopted mother died of cancer right before he went into the military. Father remarries. Father eventually moves to Florida. He's alone. And that, you know, that deep need inside of him for attachment, wanting to know who is my mom, drove him to, uh, to search for his biological mother, which he actually found her. They had a glorious reunion. But even, even that relationship, eventually he started pushing her away just as he pushed away his adopted parents because he was too afraid of developing a bond that he feared would dissipate. Why did he have anger toward the Almighty? You know, David had uh, wrestled with God throughout his entire childhood. I mean, like many of us, he had reached points where he asked that very popular question, I mean, even Jesus asked the question, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David asked that question many times, you know, God, why? You know, why was I abandoned by my birth mother? You know, why, why, why am I being shamed in school? Why are the teacher picking on me? I mean, the teacher would take his desk, put his desk in the center of the class and say to his classmates, this is where the bad boys sit. It was only in the third grade. So this resentment uh, built from the time he was young towards God, this existential rage, you know, why am I even here? Why do I even exist? Just begin to build um, until a point where when he was in his early 20s, uh, the murders, he framed those murders. He described them as payback towards God. Um, so he, you know, he asked a very human question, a question we all ask, God, where were you when I was suffering? Uh, but he took it to a level, I believe, because of satanic involvement, because of his own unresolved anger, his own shame. A lot of the factors I, I discussed in the book, he took that payback to God in a, a level that most people will never take it to. Um, but that anger towards God was not, it was not sudden, it was subtle. And it was subtly developed from the time he was young all the way until his 20s. What role did the news media, the music, or movies have in his formation? You know, David Berkowitz being uh, socially maladjusted, never really connecting well with people. Now, let me just say this before I answer your question. I don't mean he was never around people. He grew up in New York City city in the country. So he's with people all the time. He's part of baseball teams. He played on uh, baseball teams in his childhood. He was a part of the Appalachian Mountain Club, a group of teenagers that would bus up to the Appalachian Mountains from the city, and they would climb the mountains together. He was with people all the time. Uh, but there's a big difference between being with people and bonding with people. David never really bonded well with people. So what he did was he turned to TV. He turned to movies. Some of the movies that played a big role in his development, number one was Rosemary's Baby. He really, something about that movie, he said, Mike, it was uh, almost otherworldly. It was like Satan was talking to me through that movie. He almost identified himself as being Rosemary's Baby. Now, if you know anything about the movie, mm -hmm. Rosemary's Baby was the spawn of Satan. Mm -hmm. David identified deeply with that character. I think he identified deeply with characters in movies because he didn't know how to bond with people in real life. And some of the movies he picked had some very dark characters. The other movie was Taxi Driver. came out in 1975. Mm -hmm. You watched that movie several times in local theaters in New York City. You've seen it in Texas when he went on a road trip. In that movie, it was a, a character by the name of Travis Bickle, who, like David, didn't have many relationships, was kind of a loner. And in the end of the movie, Travis Bickle unleashes his wrath through a 
uh, caliber gun on New Yorkers. And that is exactly what David did. In fact, after he saw Taxi Driver, the next day he went out and he bought the same exact weapon, a 44 caliber, um, and he used that gun to gun down 13 people. <laughs> Dr. Caparelli, what types of myths were cleared up? Well, the first myth being that David was a loner in the sense that he had no relationships. You know, we think loner, and we've got we've to clear this myth up because it's not, it's not helpful in many ways. A loner is not always the guy hiding in the corner. Sometimes he's the guy hiding in the crowd. He's the guy with everybody, but he's never a part of what's going on. A good example of this in the Bible is Judas Iscariot. I mean, the guy showed up at every, at every miracle. He was at the Last Supper. He was at the washing of Jesus' feet. I mean, he's showing up everywhere. He's with the disciples, but he's never of the disciples. So that's David Berkowitz. And it, we had to clear up that myth that he was some loner like the Unabomber in a cabin, you know, with a shaggy beard, some hermit. You know, there are people that are going to be reading this book, and they're going to relate because they know what it feels like to be surrounded by a group of people but still feel disconnected. So this idea of him being a loner in the sense that he was segregated from people, that was dispelled. Um, probably another myth that was dispelled is that, uh, you know, David was not satanically possessed. That, that actually became a popular myth because David did recant his initial confessions that Satan was involved. He said he made, made it all up. Only reason why he said that was because in Attica, 1978, when he was an inmate, the inmates were harassing him severely over his devil possession story. So he backtracked. He rewrote the history of his story, and he omitted Satan. Well, he's, you know, now he's 70 years old. He's been there 46 years. And he's very firm and adamant over the fact that, yes, Satan was involved, not at the expense of his own free will. You can't have demonic possession without human permission. He definitely gave permission. Um, it was, it's not a devil-made-me-do-it story, but mm -hmm. he does acknowledge there was satanic involvement. So can violence be an addiction? Well, that's one of the things we discussed in the book is uh, David did get a rush, not only a rush, but a sense of relief from the pent-up frustration every time he pulled that trigger. And not only do I talk about David's story and how addictive the violence was in David's case, but there's lots of data within the behavioral sciences to show, you know, using rodents, to show that aggressive behavior can be as addictive as narcotics because it's a power trip. And let me tell you, a power trip, the rush that power can give someone can be more addictive than I think any type of addiction there is that's out there. Power is the most uh, addictive, non-pharmaceutical narcotic there is. It goes all the way back to Lucifer wanting to be supreme, mm -hmm. and then Lucifer putting in Eve exactly what was in him when he said to Eve, eat the fruit and you will become like God. Well, mm -hmm. that's the very statement that Lucifer said in Isaiah 14, I will become like God. So the mm -hmm. desire to be like God, to have power, to have control over someone, which is essentially what an act of violence is, is very addicting. It's very alluring. And it was the case with David Berkowitz. Brother Michael, David Berkowitz has accepted Jesus Christ into his life. He's been judged by his peers and a court judge. How about his victims and their loved ones? Any solace for them? There's not a day that goes by from David's own confession that he doesn't sob. And I've seen him sob many times. I've sat with him now over 40 sessions. Case study was 34 sessions. I can't think of many times I've met with him that he hasn't cried. And I've seen him cry, you know, those hard cries that come from the stomach. 
over what he did. Uh, David has also forged relationships with, for instance, Stacy Moskowitz's mother. Stacy was his final victim. His mother, Nasa, uh, Nasa hated David. She would often say during interviews with the media, I hope he rots in hell. I mean, she could not stand David. And David and her befriended one another. They forged a friendship. Um, in fact, they would write back and forth until Nasa died of cancer a few years back. They would talk on the phone. David made every effort possible to apologize and to own what he did. And, of course, his ultimate act of ownership is he accepts his sentence. He's not looking to get out. Um, and he, every day he tries to wrong or right those wrongs by doing the work of the Lord. He disciples 16 guys in the prison. He responds to letters that are mailed to him worldwide suicidal teenagers that have wrote letters to him. He's talked them out of suicide. He's trying to use every minute to redeem the time and to atone for his two years in New York City of holding the entire city hostage with fear. What did Jesus Christ's death mean for David Berkowitz's salvation, especially relating to forgiveness and future accountability? You know, David knows he's forgiven. He knows it. He knows it with his head, uh, and he knows it frequently with his heart. I won't say all the time because he still struggles with the guilt and the shame. But when he does feel weighed down by guilt and shame, I mean, I think any listener right now knows what it feels like to, to be under that burden of guilt you know, a heavy conscience. Uh, Let me just say this on a side note. A heavy conscience is more than just a metaphor. Princeton University did a fascinating study to show what guilt does uh, to a person psychologically. They took two groups of people, and they asked one group to recall some ethical decision they made over the last week, some decision that made them feel real good about their integrity. And then they asked them to predict their body weight, their physical body weight. They asked the second group to recall physical decision, some decision they weren't proud of, something they felt guilty about. And they asked them to predict their body weight. And when they got the results on the, the, the body weight predictions, the group that had recalled an unethical decision had predicted their body weight to be substantially more than what it actually It's more than just a metaphor. We feel weighed down and weighed down by his. He arrives at that place of feeling guilt ridden. Full of to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He revisits the story of the cross, and it's there at Calvary that his conscience is cleansed and he's set free once again from his sins and from the guilt and the shame that the sins brought. How does your book challenge a culture and clinical community that says there's no hope for psychopaths? Well, here it is. Here's a living example Mm -hmm. of someone who no doubt was a psychopath. I mean, when you look at the criteria for psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder, as it's described in the DSM, DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, of psychological disorders, that's the Bible for psychiatrists, Um, you look at that criteria, he meets the criteria with flying colors. You know, David prior to Christ. He had no empathy or very low empathy. He uh, acted impulsively, no control over his impulses. Um, He showed no sorrow or regret over his crimes, exploited people for his own personal gain. I mean, he meets the he lights up the psychopathy scoreboard with flying colors. Now, the data shows psychopaths make no progress in therapy, that their brains are not like our brains. However, 
We know now through lots of studies in neuroplasticity that the brain is changing all the time. I mean, the Bible says that our minds would be renewed. Well, the mind has to be renewable if the mind can be renewed. Well, neuroplasticity has shown that the brain is renewable, that the way the brain is today doesn't have to be like that tomorrow. David Berkowitz is not the same guy. How do I know? Here's how I know. I have not only seen his actions, I've seen his reactions. People can put on a good act. People think actions are a telltale of character. They're not. People can act very well. But what's hard to fake is reactions. Reactions is how a man acts under pressure, how he acts when he's caught off guard. I've seen David angry. If you spend 100 hours with somebody, you get to see a lot of different sides of who they are. I've seen him get angry. One of the sessions I describe in the book, he had a conflict with an inmate. I walked into the session. He was enraged. I, walked, I watched him walk through that anger. I watched him, as Ephesians 4 says, get angry but sin not. That kind of impulse control is not typical of a psychopath. I've seen him demonstrate empathy towards his victims and towards their families. I've seen him do all the things that psychopaths can't do, and I describe it in the book. And to me, it's the fruit of the man's life. I've tasted that fruit, and it's good, that shows that in the hands of God, even a psychopath can be transformed. You know, I'm thinking about when I asked you the question earlier, and you had answered as relates to why you study as relates to advanced behavior. And I'm reminded of in the Word of God where it talks about the heart is the sequel above all things who can know it. And I bring those two together because you have been blessed and are being blessed to be in the position to walk along with not only uh, David Berkowitz, but others. So that just like you just shared, being able to see with your own eyes that which you need to see so that you can make a determination, not a judgment, but if the shoes aren't matching the lips, then that's giving you an idea of whether that fruit is true or not. And that's why I appreciate all that you're sharing. How can listeners purchase your books, all your books, you can go, and contact you? You can actually go on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, Amazon, you can get the Kindle, which is the digital version. You can get a Spanish copy if you're a Spanish uh, speaker reader. You can look for the title in Spanish, Monster Mera, but look it up in Spanish. Or you can get the paperback Monster Mera. The audio version will not be out until sometime next year. Um, but you can go on Amazon, get the paperback English, paperback Spanish, or the Kindle. Or you can go on Barnes & Noble and get the English paperback I don't know if you can, you can't get the Spanish paperback of Barnes and Noble. You can only get that on Amazon. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the two popular ways: is Amazon and Kindle. I mean, in Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And if the listeners want to contact you for interviews and so forth, how would you want them to do so? They can they can contact me at Dr. Caparelli, which is D R dot Caparelli C A P A R R E L L I at gmail.com, and I'd be more than happy to work something out with you. Brother Michael, how did God save you from personal destruction? I was 17 years old, locked up in a juvenile jail. I robbed a Providence police car. Uh, It was unmarked. I didn't know it was a cop car until me and my two friends broke into it, full of anger. Um, I watched my father you know, act out in certain ways and, you know, followed suit. And when I was in juvenile jail, I heard the gospel. I cried, didn't know why I was crying. Now I know it was the presence of God. That was 28 years ago. And then when I got out of the the juvenile detention center, um, I had an employer invite me to church. He didn't even know what happened in the juvenile jail. It was just God's providence. 
and then technically got saved at the church. The seeds were planted in the juvenile jail. And then I never looked back. And then from that day forward, um, not only was I saved, but I was called into ministry early on. Went to Bible college, got my bachelor's degree in biblical theology, my master's degree from Liberty University. Mm-hmm. So I got a strong theological foundation first, and then got my Ph.D., uh, secular degree in the behavioral sciences. Um, so, yeah, from an early age, I mean, God saved me from, my, saved me from myself. At, at 18 years old, and I never, I never looked back, and that was almost 28 years ago. Praise God. Any final words for the listeners? Yes. Uh, you think David Berkowitz is a monster. I mean, I can certainly understand why you think that. Gunned down 13 people. He lit 1,400 fires. He held an entire city hostage with fear. When you read Monster Mirror, you're going to look not into a monster. You're going to look into a mirror, and you're going to find out that David Berkowitz is not a monster from the abyss. He's the boy next door, and there is a psychopath, a potential psychopath in everybody. But for the grace of God, so go I. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> Listeners, you know it's been said that there are going to be people – in heaven that you thought shouldn't be there. And there's not going to be people in heaven that you thought just ought to have been there. And just like our beloved brother is sharing today, just make sure that you're there. Mm. Brother Michael, thank you for taking the time, coming on Challenges of Faith radio program, and I invite you back for the discussion of your other books as well, whenever God so leads. Thank you, Pastor. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Bless you and your ministry. Thank you, sir. All right, listeners. You just heard from my guest, Dr. Michael A. Caparelli, the author of Monster Mirror, 100 Hours with David Berkowitz, once known as Son of Sam. Brother Michael released his book a few weeks ago, and it was ranked number one and True Crime on Amazon for the first week of its launch. He also has appeared on many venues and was recently featured on the 700 Club, Dr. Carolyn Leafs, and Dr. Daniel Amon's Club. Michael says, with Jesus Christ, all things are possible. We'll have our brother back on to discuss his other books and his nonprofit organization, Unmuted. As we close, please remember the two men on the cross of Calvary that was with our Savior. Do you remember why they were there? And a guy known as Saul, who was on the Supreme Court of Israel in that day, before he became the Apostle Paul. Do you remember how he went around killing Christians and putting them in jail? Then he met Jesus Christ. 